Thanksgiving Eve 1971, supermarkets were bustling with last-minute shoppers, all eager to prepare their feasts. It was a night like any other, or so it seemed. Little did anyone know that by the end of the evening, a hijacker would board a plane and leave an indelible mark on the nation. When he got on a plane in Portland, Oregon last night, he was just another passenger who gave his name as D.A. Cooper. But today, after hijacking a Northwest Airlines jet, ransoming the passengers in Seattle, then making a getaway by parachute somewhere between there and Reno, Nevada, the description on one wire service, master criminal. Bill Curtis reports. 36 passengers got off the jetliner in Seattle last night, left aboard four crew members and the hijacker, dressed in a business suit demanding $200,000 and carrying a plain briefcase which he told the crew held explosives. With the full ransom collected from Seattle banks and four parachutes aboard, the plane headed for Reno. It took three and a half hours, slow for a jet, but the hijacker had given detailed flight instructions. The rear stairwell was open all the way. It arrived at Reno in shreds. Police believe he left the 727 in the flatlands of Oregon or Washington, but they are still looking in four states, even around the airport. Authorities began their search here, thinking the hijacker may have jumped off at the end of the runway as the plane touched down. But the problem is more complex. A daring parachute escape from a flying 727 somewhere between Reno and Seattle, Washington. Bill Curtis, CBS News. This is the story of D.B. Cooper, a mystery that continues to baffle and intrigue us to this day. On the day before Thanksgiving, November the 24th, 1971, a man in a sleek black suit approached the ticket counter at an airport in Portland paying $20 in cash for a one-way journey to Seattle Tacoma International Airport. After signing the ticket in striking red ink, he took a solitary seat, anticipating the quick flight. Once aboard, he nestled into the last row of the plane, nursing a bourbon and soda, remaining inconspicuous until he quietly passed a handwritten note to a flight attendant. She believed it was merely an attempt to hit on her until the man with horn-brimmed sunglasses pressed her to read what was written. The note ominously stated, Miss, I have a bomb here, and I would like you to sit by me. His ticket clearly displayed the name, Dan Cooper, in all caps. Yet, in the frenzy of reporting the hijacking, the United Press International mistakenly identified the hijacker as D.B. Cooper. The FBI released a correction the next day, but unfortunately the era had already made its way around the globe, and the DB label remained firmly in place. High above the ground, flight attendant Tina Mucklow settled next to Cooper at his request. He opened a briefcase to reveal wires, a battery, and red sticks inside. Cooper was asking for 200000 around one and a half million in 2024 terms waiting for them in Seattle. If he received the cash and parachutes, he would permit the 36 passengers and almost all the flight attendants to exit, whilst the pilots would stay with him on the aircraft. Following the acquisition of the money and a quick refuel at SeaTac, the crew obeyed Cooper's command to take Northwest Orient Flight 305 to Mexico. Just after takeoff, Cooper made a bold move by extending the rear stairs, a fact that left airport officials stunned as they were completely unaware that such an action was even feasible until Cooper called for it. Roughly 20 miles north of Portland, the FBI has yet to pinpoint the precise location where Cooper jumped. 
The Boeing 727, manufactured in Renton, was flying at 196 miles per hour and about 10,000 feet in the air. The wind chill at that elevation was far below zero. More than 50 years on, the FBI has not conclusively identified Cooper making his case the only unresolved airplane hijacking in the world. On February the 10th, 1980, a memorable Sunday, eight-year-old Brian Ingram made a remarkable discovery as the first and only known individual to find part of Cooper's loot. Apart from the FBI's earlier recovery of fragments, at the same site. The young boy was enjoying a picnic with his parents, Harold and Patricia, at Tina Bar, also referred to as Tina Bar, on the Washington side of the Columbia River in Clark County, approximately 10 miles northwest of their home in Vancouver. Ingram was leveling the sand to help his dad create a campfire. I took my arm and raked it along the sand, and then I felt something fluffed up in the sand, Ingram shared with the Oklahomian in 1986. Together with his five-year-old cousin, Denise Ingram, the eight-year-old boy struck gold as they dug through the sand, uncovering money buried between three inches and three feet deep. I thought, wow, he told the Seattle Times. I saw it was money, and I went over to my parents. They thought it was counterfeit. Brian's father said the find was like a ball of wet pulp. I thought it was play money, Denise Ingram told a reporter in an account later disputed by Brian Ingram's mother. We both found it. It was buried in the sand. I gave it to Brian. Denise's mother, Crystal Ingram, said the kids used sticks to dig the rest of it. There wasn't nothing more, she said. We dug for a while, but we didn't find nothing but sand underneath. It was out Fourth Plain Road. We were just out there watching the boats going up and down, roasting some hot dogs. It was really pretty out there Sunday. There wasn't no bag. We just put it in a plastic bag from our bread. One of us did mention that it possibly could be D.B. Cooper's, but we kept on going with our picnic and didn't think nothing of it, Crystal said. The FBI took possession of three tattered bundles of cash using the serial numbers provided by Seattle First National Bank on the night of the hijacking to identify the bills. These bills were packed into a 19-pound bag with the dimensions of 11 inches by 12 inches by 6.5 inches. The serial numbers were documented on microfilm before Cooper got his hands on the money. When the bills were uncovered, several were so severely damaged that they could not be read. Some were noted to be the dimensions of a business card, and a handful appeared to be entirely black. The family assessed that merely 30 of the bills were still in acceptable condition. Nevertheless, Bill Baker, the assistant special agent in charge at the Portland FBI office, remarked that this was the first substantial clue the FBI had uncovered since the night of the hijacking, leading to bold headlines in Seattle's newspapers. After their discovery, the Ingrams approached the FBI the very next day, and their story quickly made headlines worldwide. Following a news conference on February the 12th, 
at the FBI's Portland office. The FBI confirmed that the money was part of the ransom packets given to Cooper. Two packets of $120 bills and a third containing 90 bills, all arranged in the same sequence as in 1971. An FBI case agent noted that the choice of smaller bills was intended to hinder Cooper's escape by weighing him down. Just two days after Ingram's find, FBI agents made another significant discovery of bill fragments while digging. Paul Hudson, the FBI site coordinator, shared with reporters that these fragments were similar in size to nickels and quarters and were found about five feet away from Ingram's location. Interestingly, some of the fragments were located three feet below the surface of the sand. On February the 13th, the FBI launched an investigation at the site of Cooper's Bill's discovery, bringing the backhoe along with specialists in soil, archaeology, and river currents. The Seattle Times noted that this beach area adjacent to a dairy farm is a popular fishing spot for steelhead. While fishermen and curious bystanders gathered, they were both turned away as the FBI conducted their search. The intense focus of international media soon became overwhelming for the Ingrams, who spent a day assisting the FBI in locating the bills, and another day conversing with reporters. My husband lost one and a half days of pay, and my sister-in-law won't come over to my house anymore, Patricia Ingram told the Seattle Post Intelligencer nearly two weeks after the find. We've gone in the hole as a result of this. Her husband, Harold, saw a reduction of roughly $100 in his pay from his job as a heavy equipment painter. They were living on a tight budget, unable to purchase a phone, and barely getting by from one paycheck to the next. Originally, Northwest Orient had offered a $25,000 bounty for the return of the $200,000 ransom. However, the Ingrams were later notified that the offer was rescinded as the airline's insurance had reimbursed them for 90% of the total loss. A $1,000 reward was put forth by the Oregon Journal for the first $20 from the Cooper loot, yet the Ingrams never got their hands on that money, and the publication shut down in 1982. Brian's mother refuted the idea that the money was found by his five-year-old cousin, mentioning that the only uplifting moment came from the hero's welcome her son experienced in his second grade classroom. Brian's a hero in their eyes. The first couple of days they demanded his autograph and they carried him around on their shoulders, Patricia said. The FBI is still unable to determine the exact circumstances that led to the bills being located next to the Columbia. It's possible that it washed up here a period of time ago, not nine years ago, but not necessarily recently. Hudson, the FBI site coordinator, told reporters three days after Ingram's find. The theory found support in the words of Sidney Tipper, an 80-year-old fisherman who had spent the last 10 years exploring that part of the river. He remarked that if there had been any money in the vicinity, he would have surely discovered it. FBI agents indicated that the money could have been washed downstream, perhaps by a tributary leading to the Columbia. 
According to a hydrologist with the Army Corps of Engineers, the only tributary that could have potentially carried the money was the Washago River. The FBI's early hypothesis suggested that Cooper might have met his end in Lake Merwin, situated on the Lewis River to the north of Amboy. Some speculated that he could have entered the reservoir behind the aerial dam. Nevertheless, the Lewis River actually joins the Columbia downstream from where the money was ultimately found. Ralph Himmelsbach, the FBI agent in charge of the Cooper case, from the hijacking night until his retirement on the last day of February in 1980, was convinced that the bag of money was situated close to a stream. He believed that as the water rose, it swept the bag downstream before it ultimately fell apart. We think finally tumbling down the river bottom. It broke open and the money was carried on, wearing off little bits and pieces around the edges, grinding it down like it had been ground with sandpaper or a file, leaving the center portion. During Ingram's discovery, John D. Pringle, then the assistant special agent at the Seattle FBI office, was convinced that Cooper was either no longer alive or had discarded the money. The small town of Ariel saw a surge in interest, thanks to the speculation surrounding it. Starting in 1976, the Ariel Tavern's annual D.B. Cooper party on November the 24th became a popular event, attracting hundreds who came to enjoy buffalo stew, look for Cooper, and muse about whether he might be present. After Ingram's discovery, tavern owner Dave Fisher was swamped with calls from reporters in New York and radio stations throughout the West Coast. The bills were contested by four parties, the FBI, Brian Ingram and his parents, Northwest Orient Airlines, and the airline's insurer, Globe Indemnity Company. On May the 21st, 1986, a proposed judgment was presented to the U.S. District Court Judge Helen Fry, designating $280 for the FBI as evidence, with the leftover $5,520 to be shared by Ingram and Globe Indemnity. Brian Ingram, then a 15-year-old, received a $2,760 share in June of 1986, and he was eager to sell it. When we do make the money, if it is just okay, it will put me through college. If it's a little better than okay, then college and a down payment on a house. If it's better than that, then college and we'll buy a house, he told the Oklahomian. The Ingram family made their way out of the small central Oklahoma town of El Reno in the autumn of 1979 in search of employment in the Pacific Northwest. They were residing in Portland when the judge's decision was officially recorded. In 2006, Brian Ingram was a carpenter residing in Minna, Arkansas. He informed a reporter that he was teaming up with a lawyer to auction 17 torn bills and remnants of Cooper's loot. With a wife and three children, Ingram felt it was the right time to sell and invest in their future. His family had moved back to Oklahoma when he was a teenager. After high school, he served three years in the Army and made his way to Minna around 1994. He told the reporter that the bills were safely stored in a deposit box. By March 2008, Ingram, now a busy parent of five, decided to enlist PCGS currency to authenticate 15 bills ahead of their auction. 
In September, the Associated Press announced that these bills sold for a remarkable $37,000 at Heritage Auction Galleries in Dallas, which was two to three times higher than anticipated. Interestingly, some of the bills included the initials of the investigators who had looked into the money right after its 1980 discovery when it was sent to an FBI lab in Washington, D.C. for further scrutiny. By the year 1975, five years ahead of Ingram's significant fight, the FBI claimed to have chased down thousands of leads and eliminated hundreds of suspects from their inquiries. In the years that followed, even more leads appeared, along with several deathbed confessions, yet the FBI found none of them credible. Among the many films released, an HBO documentary stood out. As the 2015 conclusion of Mad Men approached, there was a flurry of speculation that the protagonist, Don Draper, was secretly D.B. Cooper. This theory prompted the show's creator to publicly deny the connection. In 2024, fans of Cooper gather for CooperCon, which was set to be held in Boston, Dallas, and Seattle. Larry Carr, the FBI case agent from 2007 to 2010, took the reins of the investigation and sought input from the public, revealing evidence from a cardboard box that had been tucked away in the Seattle FBI office for years. This effort rekindled interest and resulted in a wave of tips, but Carr was unconvinced that the hijacker had lived through the ordeal. You have D.B. Cooper walking down the stairs. As soon as he's standing there, he really can't feel the wind coming around him from the plane going 200 miles per hour. And so, when he jumps out of the aircraft, I think he just started tumbling. Right then, just tumbling. Panics. And once you panic, you really can't do anything. So he's falling. He doesn't know where he's at. He can't see. He has has no visual reference on the ground, he's out of control in the air and starts the panic, can't pull his chute and hits the ground without ever opening his chute. The FBI sometimes labeled the hijacking as a capital crime, which allows for prosecution without a time limit. Nevertheless, on Thanksgiving Eve in 1976, the very last day before the five-year statute of limitations for hijacking would expire, a federal grand jury in Portland decided to indict John Doe, also known as Dan Cooper, preparing for the possibility that the FBI might eventually identify the hijacker. On July the 11th, 2016, the Bureau revealed that it would no longer pursue the Cooper hijacking case, codenamed Norjack. Spokesperson Ein Dietrich Williams remarked that it had been one of the longest and most exhaustive investigations in our history, but the agency needed to redirect its resources to other critical investigations. Despite the influx of thousands of earnest tips, none yielded the conclusive evidence necessary to establish proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Out. When discussing Cooper's actual identity, there's a romanticized image of a dashing individual. As Jeffrey Gray, author of the New York Times bestseller Skyjack, the hunt for D.B. Cooper points out, in truth, his tie was just a clip-on from J.C. Penney, and his suit jacket was mismatched with his pants. 
He did not request large bills, which led the FBI to provide him with smaller ones to add weight. Investigators doubt he was aware that one of the four parachutes was sewn shut. Gray told CBS News that the man is probably quite different from the legendary persona we have created. As we gather around our Thanksgiving tables, sharing stories and reflecting on the past, the tale of D.B. Cooper remains one of the most intriguing mysteries in American history. Despite decades of investigation, countless theories, and numerous suspects, the true identity of the man who vanished into the night with $200,000 remains elusive. Perhaps that is what makes the story of D.B. Cooper so captivating. It is a reminder that some mysteries are destined to remain unsolved, leaving us to wonder and speculate. In a world where information is at our fingertips, the enigma of D.B. Cooper stands as a testament to the enduring allure of the unknown. So, as we enjoy our Thanksgiving feast, let us toast to the mysteries that keep us guessing and the stories that continue to captivate our imagination. Who knows, maybe one day we will uncover the truth, but until then, D.B. Cooper will remain a legend, a ghost in the annuals of history, and a symbol of the ultimate escape. I thank you for watching, and have a happy Thanksgiving.